Hello, everybody. We are now doing the Unit 1 review. This is the review for your first Art History Survey 2 unit test on the Renaissance. A couple things to be aware of for the test. The structure will be very similar to what uh, you may be accustomed to from other art history courses. You'll have to identify some artworks. You'll have to make some critical decisions about art and be able to apply the relevant vocabulary terms. So the way that the test is structured, you'll have 10 identifications. I'll choose 10 works from the uh, pieces that were highlighted in red for us that were also on the first slide of each lecture, and they're also listed on the ID vocab uh, review sheet. So I'll choose 10 of those, and you'll have multiple choice options to select from to identify the correct uh, sequence of artist, title, date, and relevant uh, cultural information vocabulary term. In place of compare contrast essays, I've devised a system wherein I'll show you a pair of artworks and then a listing of statements about those works, and you'll sort those statements into categories. Either the statements will be applicable to both artworks or they will perhaps be applicable only to one of the two works. The statement may in fact not apply to either of the works. So it's the same type of uh, thinking that would be involved in a compare contrast essay, but you won't actually be writing an essay. There will be 40 points worth of the identifications. There will be 40 points worth of this compare contrast activity. You'll see five pairs of work in that section. So the remaining 20 points of the test will be made up of multiple choice, true, false, and fill in the blank uh, questions. So a format you're more used to. Just be aware that everything that's on the review sheet will show up on the test. If an item is not selected for an identification, it might be used in the compare contrast. If uh, an artwork is not included as either an ID or a compare contrast, it will show up as one of the multiple choice true false questions toward the end. So everything that's on the review sheet will show up on the test. The online class is set up to allow you two attempts at the test. Uh, and each attempt you'll have two and a half hours to complete. So I would recommend studying first, doing your best effort on your first attempt, checking your score. If the score is not satisfactory to you, go back, study again, and then come back and make your second attempt on the test. Blackboard will automatically record the higher of the two scores. So obviously if you get an A the first time, no need to take it twice, but you do have that option. So some terms I want to call your attention to right away as we're looking at the review for Unit 1, uh, the issue of classicism. Classicism for our purposes, or the classical world, is going to always refer to ancient Greece and Rome. So classicism is the intentional imitation of the artwork and the philosophy of the ancient world of the Greeks and the Romans. So studying and emulating art and philosophy from the past is very much what the Renaissance is about. In fact, the term Renaissance means the rebirth of the classical studies, rebirth of classicism. So specifically for us, basically the 200 year period between 14, the 1400s up to about 1600. Um, we also want to look at the classical orders. Those are styles of architecture that derive from ancient Greece and were picked up by the Romans and continued into the Renaissance. You'll see them even in uh, contemporary architecture today. They are identifiable by the top of the column, which is known as the capital. The Doric column is the most basic. It's a simple drum. The Ionic is the style has curly cues on the corner. Those curly cues are properly known as volutes, V-O-L-U-T-E-S. And the most decorative style is the Corinthian, which is carved to look like decorative acanthus leaves. The contraposto is important for us to know, also coming from the ancient world. We saw this evolving in statuary in Greece and in Rome. It's very different from what you might be familiar with in Mesopotamian and Egyptian sculpture. Mesopotamian and Egyptian in particular 
figures that are standing tend to carry the same amount of weight on both legs. They are very stiff in their poses. The Greek and Roman style that really influences the Renaissance involves a more natural position of the body. The figures stand more like the way real human beings do, in which we tend to put most of our weight on one leg, we contract the muscles in that leg to hold our weight up, and we have the opposite leg in a more relaxed position, which causes the engaged leg to raise the hip on that side of the body and to counterbalance or weight shift to create the contraposto, we tilt our shoulders in the opposite direction to keep ourselves from tipping over. And you can see some examples there. You can see that example of uh, the David by Michelangelo being compared to a classical example. Uh, you can see he uses the same type of pose in his figures for the tomb as well. So that weight shift is a idea that comes to us from the ancient world. It's meant to make the figures seem very believable, very real, and they seem to move and stand in believable ways. Um, thinking about the structure of society in the Renaissance is pretty important for us. We want to think about the fact that we didn't have art schools. If artists were seeking training, they became apprentices. An apprentice would live and work in the household and studio of a master artist. They would do the work that the master was not interested in doing, the cleaning of brushes, grinding of pigments, the uh, basics would be done by the apprentices. In exchange for that service, they would receive training in how to draw, how to paint, how to create art, how to manage commissions, all of that type of training. Um, would be, a, in a sense, almost a one-on-one -on -one in a workshop situation as opposed to in a school. The master artists themselves were members of guilds, and in fact, each professional trade had an official guild. The guild acted somewhat like a trade union and somewhat like an oversight committee and somewhat like a service organization um, doing community service. The idea of the guild was to maintain the quality of the work of that particular trade. And so an artist guild would help to um, determine the type of pricing that one could expect uh, to help value work, to certainly um, provide opportunities for artists to seek commissions as well, um, and on occasion to create work or to commission work as a group for the purposes of uh, public view. So the guild is in some ways um, driving the economy of the Renaissance, you would not be able to be successful in any trade unless you had gained membership into the guild that governed that particular trade and oversaw the price structure and membership and all other aspects. So artists would seek membership in the guild, they would establish themselves as professionals, they would take on apprentices, and when the apprentice finishes his um, term of service, then he would be eligible to try to become a member of the guild and set up his own workshop. So that was the art training and kind of economic system. The way that artists were paid for work is also quite different to what we're accustomed to in the 21st century. We think of artists nowadays making work providing an opportunity for people to view it, and then hopefully they would be able to sell that work to clients who were interested. The Renaissance system works very differently from that. The Renaissance system involved the client, the person who wanted the artwork, dictating to the artist what they wanted them to make. The person paying for the work is known as the patron. The patron could go to various professional artists' workshops and see examples of an artist's work, decide who they thought was the best fit for what they wanted, and then they would tell the artist what they wanted them to make. So a contract would be written that would specify the subject and even down to the size, the type of color, all of those things could be included in the contract between the patron and the artist. So we saw several examples of artworks that were very similar in terms of their theme, the narrative story being shown, and the composition. And that's to be expected in a system like this because the patron will be 
uh, seeking art to be made for their own private home, but even more frequently, patrons would seek artists to create frescoes and other decorations for public works in chapels that they and their families would be dedicating and paying for the upkeep and decoration of. So a lot of the artwork that artists were hired to make would be seen by the people of um, a given town because they would go to the uh, cathedral within that city and they would of course see artwork in these individual family chapels. So it was a prestige aspect. It was uh, basically a system in which the elite class did kind of dictate what art looked like, but of course also people expected certain types of scenes to be depicted in churches. So it's not unusual to see annunciations or last suppers, uh, variations on those same themes done by a variety of different artists. So the professional artist would be a member of a guild, he would have apprentices to train, Patrons would go to the artist workshop, select the artists they wanted to uh, work with, and dictate to them what art to make. The philosophy that is dominant in the Renaissance is humanism, and it is a very specific approach to, to the thought about what a good person should do with their professional life. If you were a follower of the humanist philosophy, you didn't assume that people were just perfect, but rather that people were perfectible, that you could achieve greatness through effort, and that part of that effort was necessary study of the classics, of the art and culture of ancient Greece and Rome. So humanists really believed in human potential, that we might not have it right yet, but we were going to try to get as close to perfection within our own lifetimes as we possibly could. Just to give you a quick uh, view again of the classical orders, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, I wanted you to also see not just the diagrams, but these photographs of actual examples from the classical world. So you can kind of get an idea of what those architectural styles look like. In general, the Doric style is a little shorter and more broad. The Ionic style is a little more elegant, more slender. The Corinthian style tends to be very, very narrow and very, very tall, almost a little overdone in a way. Some terms that come to us as we transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, very important, the idea of the Greek manner, or what we sometimes call the Italo-Byzantine style, and you see that here in the work of Cimabue. The Italo-Byzantine is a reference specifically to the fact that the Roman Empire had split in half, and it was the Eastern or Byzantine Empire that continued, lasted longer, and it continued some of the traditions of the art and culture of ancient Rome into the Middle Ages. And so art that we see in Italy in particular that's influenced by that Eastern style is pretty easy to recognize. You'll see this very uh, bold golden background. A lot of the figures seem to be very, very close to the surface of the picture plane. The faces seem very often to be almost replicas of a stock type. The faces of the angels, for instance, look almost identical one to the other, and they're very similar, in fact, to the face of Mary in this painting. Um, the Italo-Byzantine style looks to our eyes nowadays as more of a medieval style. The fully believable perspective and three-dimensional illusion of the bodies is not developed yet. So we're seeing kind of a transition toward that goal when we look at art that we can classify as Italo-Byzantine or as Greek manner or Greek style. Uh, the most evident aspect in terms of the way the paintings are made, other than the gold background, is probably what we call, in quotes, shading in reverse. Rather than applying highlight and shadow and softly modeling transition from light to dark on the fabric, you can see there's a bit of a tendency to make a dark colored fabric appear to have highlight and shadow by applying lighter color onto the tops of the folds. And that may be in a light, a white, 
or in gold. One of the first works to recognize for sure for the test is the work here by Ambrosio Lorenzetti. This is a portion of the effects of good government in the city and in the country. We're looking primarily at the city portion here. It is a fresco. It was in essentially the town hall in Siena, and it essentially acts as a reminder for the members of the city council, the leaders, to maintain a good government and it also is kind of a promise to the people of what to expect if you have a good government you'll have uh, well ordered streets you'll have uh, peaceful commerce you'll have people living in harmony and that's very much what the painting's about you can see the beginnings of really good perspective it's not worked out perfectly yet but you can see that the artists are becoming more and more aware of creating believable three-dimensional illusion you can see that if you were to overlay the leading lines or perspective lines guidelines what we should properly call orthogonal lines onto the sides of these buildings the orthogonals would not all meet at a common vanishing point it's still not quite perfect one-point perspective, but we're getting a little bit closer to that in the work of Lorenzetti. Another term that I usually put quotation marks around, it's not one that you'll see in every single art history book, but it's a really good description of how art is beginning to change in the Renaissance, is the term clothed nude. And you can very clearly see that here in the work of Giotto in his fresco for the Arena Chapel. This is just one of many panels in that uh, chapel. This is the Lamentation. So one of the standard scenes that you would see um, of the story of the crucifixion, um, not only do you see certain events leading up to the crucifixion, but you often see this uh, Lamentation, the body removed from the cross before burial. So other artists will tackle a similar story. But the term clothed nude is really evident to us here, especially when you look at the figures surrounding the body of Christ. You can see that there is that overall Renaissance lighting, which in this case does seem to be coming from the left hand, upper left hand side of the uh, fresco. And shadows seem to be primarily on the right hand side of the figures and cast onto the ground. So there's an overall consistent light source. And as it falls across the backs of the figures, you really can see that the light seems to be following the contours of those bodies as if the artist knows the anatomy underneath the robes. And that's what makes them seem so much more three-dimensionally believable. So that's the kind of ironic term we're using, clothed nude, implies obviously that the person has clothing on, but that the artist understands what the anatomy looks like underneath, and that's what makes that look believable. We'll run into the term fresco again and again. For our purposes here, a fresco is going to be painted directly onto plaster on a wall. That plaster will be applied only in the amount that the artist can complete in one working session, and the Italian method of working in fresco is to paint in tempera on the fresco plaster while the plaster is still somewhat wet and so the pigment absorbs into the plaster. Instead of thinking of it as being painted on the wall, you could almost imagine it as being painted into the wall. It really makes it more permanent. Another artist for us to recognize, very important artist for us, is Masaccio. This piece is the Holy Trinity, and it introduces for us the first really great example of linear perspective. In this case, we're meant to be seeing essentially a sacred conversation style painting. You don't really see the crucifixion taking place outdoors um, as it would have been. What we're seeing really are the patrons who paid for the piece praying and they are seeing Mary and John honoring Christ both on the cross as the uh, figure of God the Father and also you see here, that little white wisp is actually the dove that represents the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Trinity, all three together. But instead of being in an outdoor setting, they seem to be framed by this 
barrel vaulted ceiling of a long-ish hallway. Uh, and that's all made possible by the illusion of one point perspective. If you were to continue the orthogonal guidelines, perspective lines, leading lines between the coffers and the ceiling, they would all come together at a common vanishing point. And that vanishing point would be very ingeniously roughly at average human head height in the center. Uh, so right about here, you would see all of those angles coming together. It makes that illusion of three-dimensional depth incredibly visible. So again, what we refer to sometimes as the guidelines, perspective lines, or leading lines are properly known as orthogonals. You see the term there. In linear perspective, most frequently we see either one point or two-point perspective. In a one-point perspective situation such as this, you are parallel to the front of the object that's being depicted. In this case, we are parallel to the front plane of this structure and to the back wall down this barrel vaulted ceiling hallway. A two-point perspective would occur if you were facing the corner of something. Uh, usually the corner of the outside of a building, for instance, in which case the two side walls would appear to be receding away from you toward two different vanishing points. The horizon equates to your eye level, and the vanishing points, the points where the orthogonals meet, must be on the horizon line. Another Masaccio piece to know, of course, is the tribute money. This is a really important painting in terms of its narrative. It depicts for us three points in the story simultaneously. You have uh, Christ being asked to pay the ta uh, taxes that the uh, disciples owe. They don't have any money because they've given all their money to the poor. So he directs Peter to go fishing. Peter goes fishing and finds the golden coins that they need to pay their taxes in the mouth of the fish. So you actually see the beginning of the story in the middle, the middle of the story at the far left, and the end of the story at the far right. So Christ only appears once. Peter actually appears three times, being told what to do, doing it, and then paying off the taxes at the end. And the tax collector actually appears twice as well, asking for the taxes at the beginning, receiving the taxes at the end. In this image, you can see two pretty important aspects of the Renaissance, the chiaroscuro. That term literally means light dark, so it's the modeling of light into shadow, not just adding highlights anymore, but giving us the convincing transitions of light and shadow across the surface. You can see on all of the figures in this um, scene that the light in this case is coming from the right-hand side, and the shadows, the darkest sides, are on the uh, left on all of our figures. We can kind of see that light coming across here, across that whole scene. So the chiaroscuro is the light-dark modeling that creates illusion of three dimensions on the surfaces. We also see not only believable one-point perspective here in the building, but notice that the landscape in the background has much darker, larger, and more detailed features on the range of hills close to us. They begin to fade and become less detailed and smaller and faded as we go back in space. That's what we refer to as atmospheric or landscape perspective. Atmospheric perspective is so named because the effect of there being more atmosphere between you and something that is very distant from your eyes is the reason that something far away will appear lighter, grayer, duller, less detailed, because the light that's hitting those objects and coming towards your eye so that you can see it, those wavelengths of light are having to travel through more atmosphere in order for you to be able to see them at a great distance. And as those wavelengths of light come to your eye from a great distance through all the atmosphere, they begin to break down. So you actually see things much less detailed less intense in color, grayer, uh, blurrier even, as we increase the distance between what where we are and the thing that we're seeing in the far distance. We've talked a little bit already about the patronage system. Uh, in this case, this is an example where the city itself decided that it was necessary to have new artwork for the entrance doors 
to a rather public building, the baptistry, which stands in front of the cathedral in Renaissance Italian uh, church design. So the initial doors were moved and a competition was held to select the best artist to create new doors. And in fact, the artist who won the, this competition was so revered, he was asked back several years later to create a second set of doors to replace his own new set. So what you're seeing here is actually the second set, um, but the competition for the doors was held in 14 excuse me, 1401. And just like a reality television competition show, the best artists were tasked with creating similar works. In fact, they were all asked to depict the same subject from the Bible, the sacrifice of Isaac. And each of the artists was required to make a relief sculpture cast in bronze, had to be within the quatrefoil format or framing device that looks sort of like four circular or semicircular lobes. Within that story, they had to depict Abraham, Isaac, uh, an altar for Abraham to sacrifice his son on the angel of the Lord coming in to stop the sacrifice at the last second because, of course, Isaac... Uh, Abraham has proved his devotion to God by being willing to sacrifice his firstborn son. Uh, two servants had to be included, a uh, beast of burden for carrying everything up to the altar, and a sacrificial animal to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. All of that had to be there as well as uh, the depiction of the mountaintop and the vegetation as well. So artists had quite a challenge to create the best possible rendition of this scene, and those uh, entries were judged, and the winner of that uh, competition was Ghiberti. He won the commission, the job, to create new doors for the baptistry. And in fact, he was so successful that they asked him to come back a second time to create the ones that you see here. The Gates of Paradise are actually his second set of doors for the Florence Cathedral. A relief sculpture is different from a fully three-dimensional uh, sculpture in the round. If you think of the David standing on a pedestal and being able to be seen from 360 degree view all the way around, that's what we call a sculpture in the round, fully three-dimensional. But sculptures that project forward or recede into otherwise flat backgrounds, such as the panels that you see here in the door, uh, known as the Gates of Paradise, those are relief sculptures. The face of a president on a coin is a relief sculpture. It's a very low relief. You can have low relief or high relief. Low relief projects only slightly from the background. High relief projects quite far and creates quite a bit of shadow. You can see kind of high relief happening right here. Relatively low relief happening, though, in the background on that same panel. Uh, you can also have what we refer to as sunken relief if the image is entirely uh, recessed into the background. In this case, you're looking at the work again of Ghiberti. We call these doors the Gates of Paradise because that was the nickname that arose because of the praise that Michelangelo had for this uh, set of doors. He said they were so fantastic, the sculpture was so beautiful, that they were worthy to be the gates of heaven. We talked about fresco. Fresco is a painting style that is done in tempera, usually. And tempera paint can also be done on uh, panel. It's not great on canvas, but you could do it even on canvas. It's better on a rigid support, a hard surface. So the most common type of tempera is egg tempera. And the pigment, the coloring agent, what gives the paint its color is pretty much the same. It's the medium, what you mix the pigment with, that changes the paint type. So you could use the very same pigment to make either oil paint or tempera paint. In the case of tempera paint, we use the runny yellow part of egg yolk as the binding agent. If you've ever left uh, egg runny yellow egg yolk on a plate, not washed it immediately after a meal, you know that that 
becomes a very, very hard, very uh, clear uh, surface if it is allowed to dry. So I think that may well be how tempera was discovered. Somebody noticed that, hey, I didn't wash this dish right off, and now I've got this clear but very hard, very difficult to remove surface on my plate. I wonder what would happen if I mix some color into that. There you have egg tempera. So a fresco would be tempera paint on uh, wet plaster. Uh, that's the Italian style. Buon fresco or true fresco is done while the plaster is still somewhat wet. The cartoon is the drawing to scale that the artist uses as their guide for making their fresco. So although this drawing that you see here by Michelangelo was not actually literally used as the diagram uh, to transfer the image onto the wall, you do get the idea here of an artist making the plan, then transferring it, and then doing the painting. And the term for that, again, is the cartoon. So here you see something um, that is combining multiple steps all together at once. You would never see this happening at this rate all at the same time, but the diagram does give us a good idea of how a fresco is made. You see the assistants applying the plaster to the area that the artist thinks that they can complete in a given day. Assistants using the cartoon, the drawing on paper. It has already been pierced through with a series of tiny dots along the main outlines and contours, and this assistant is taking a canvas bag filled with charcoal dust and slapping it against the surface of the drawing in a technique called pouncing, and that forces some of the charcoal dust through the little holes, leaving a series of dots, sort of like you see here, as a guide for our artist to know where to be able to paint. Now, you would only uh, apply as much plaster to a, a section that the artist believes they can finish in one day because they are working while the plaster is still somewhat wet. So here you see the artist applying the tempera paint to the wet plaster to create this image. When you look at a fresco up close, you can see that large areas that are more simplistic, like the background of a sky or a simple uh, color of a wall behind a figure a, could be done relatively quickly. But an area that has this much contour and highlight and shadow and detail, the figure itself would be much more time consuming to paint than the background behind him. So you can see here, there's a line, if you look really closely, that goes around the outside of the figure all the way around. And if you see a fresco up close, you can often detect the barrier between one day's work and the next. One day's work is known as a ginarata. We've already talked about patrons commissioning work. This would be the type of work that was commissioned for a private home, or in this case, the palace of a very wealthy client. The Medici family were the leading family in Florence during the Renaissance. They uh, controlled the banking industry. And this series of paintings, this one of the image that you see here is one of a series of three that was commissioned from the artist Uccello to celebrate Florence's victories over enemies in military combat. These were commissioned by the Medici to be hung in their uh, family home in a bedroom. In this case, the Battle of San Romano is the piece to know by Uccello. It is most recognizable because of his very careful use of perspective. Although you don't see perspective on a building, in this case, you actually see it on bodies of people and animals. If you look at the knight here in the uh, foreground, and also even the back end of this horse, for instance, the way this horse seems to be rearing toward us, you see the application of perspective rules onto nonlinear objects. That is known as foreshortening. The part of the body is in the foreground is enlarged and the overall length of the body is shortened, hence the term foreshortening. We have danced around this term for a little while. The sacred conversation or sacra conversazioni are the style or the name for the category rather of paintings, religious paintings, which feature an enthroned Mary holding the Christ child flanked by angels and or saints on either side. So these are not retelling biblical stories. This is not Mary holding the Christ child in the manger scene. This is 
the way that these two uh, deities, if you will, holy personages, appear in heaven. They're being revered by saints who themselves may have been uh, living in very different time periods one to the other. So saints can appear as they are uh, in their own lifetimes. They sometimes appear in a specific costume or clothing that will help you to identify them. The saints sometimes will even hold um, objects that reference the way that they were martyred if they were put to death. So you'll see very often kind of a um, idealized vision of heaven when you see a sacred conversation because it's not depicting a specific biblical narrative or story event. You're seeing these um, characters, so to speak, um, in a perfect setting as if they are continuing their worship in heaven itself. Definitely want to recognize the Last Supper as painted by Andrea del Castaño. You can definitely recognize this one as being different from Leonardo da Vinci's because, of course, Judas is very easily recognizable. He's the one that no one wants to sit next to. He is on our side of the table, isolated from everyone else. Another sacred conversation painting that should be a really uh, easy to recognize uh, painting type for us or category. There's also a diagram on this slide that very clearly shows us the application of that perfect one point perspective, making Mary's face the vanishing point that all of our leading or orthogonal lines are leading toward. Uh, you also very clearly see in this one the inclusion of the patron, the, art, the person who paid for, commissioned the work. This is the Duke of Urbino. You see him kneeling to the right in his armor. We talked about contraposto. Again, remember that the most ancient examples have very equal weight on both legs, and it makes the figure appear very stiff. So this very early Greek example on the left is very different from a much later Greek example on the right, in which you can clearly see the weight of the body being carried more fully on one leg than the other. You see that exact pose, that exact weight shift happening here in the work of Donatello. This is his version of the figure of David. Very easy to tell Donatello's David apart from Michelangelo's because we are seeing the story after the battle has taken place. You see the decapitated head of the giant under David's foot. Another piece to know by Donatello, this was a carving as opposed to the bronze cat David. This one is known as the Prophet Zucon or Habakkuk. The nickname implies that he is, um, it actually translates from Italian as pumpkin head, which is kind of funny. The uh, old pumpkin head is what he's sometimes referred to as because of the big bald head. The head is a little bit out of proportion because this sculpture was originally on the uh, bell tower next to the Florence Cathedral. The bell tower or campanile has sculptures on it, they are about two stories above ground level, so you would have seen them from below. Botticelli is our uh, early Renaissance artist in Italy who is perhaps most associated with reviving the mythological stories and scenes. It is kind of odd in a way to think about there are so many religious paintings and sculptures in Italian Renaissance and then suddenly you see a nude female, not a, Mary, not a Bible story. Remember that the Italians are reviving their own culture. So the ancient Roman religion in which the goddess Venus would be revered is really their own culture. So the artists are in some ways looking at classical examples of sculpture and painting to try to guide them, but they're also interested in reviving those stories as well. So an entire philosophy is born during the Renaissance in which people began to try to find connections between the beliefs of the ancestors of the Roman Empire in particular, uh, and how those beliefs, those ideas of gods and goddesses, the stories of classical mythology could act as sort of precursors or um, foreshadowing of the stories of the Bible that were to come later. So to some people's belief system during the Renaissance, it does take a little bit of what I call mental gymnastics to work your head around this idea. Some people began to see a connection between Mary, 
the Queen of Heaven, and the goddess Venus, because they both represent this idea of a pure state of love. So it does take a little bit of thinking to get there, but you can kind of see it. Remember, of course, that we're seeing a rise in oil painting, a transition from tempera painting dominating things to oil painting beginning to dominate things as we move into the high renaissance. Oil painting, same pigments as what we saw with the tempera paint, but it is now mixed with linseed oil. That makes the paint transparent. It also makes it very slow to dry, which allows artists to do painting in layers that are transparent a technique we call glazing. You see that happening here. The glaze of a yellowish color is being applied on top of the painting that's already uh, started here in a more pale green and blue. You also can see that happening in a traditional way of painting across this portrait that a set of values, light, dark, and all the grays in between, would be established in a gray painting, sometimes called a grisaille, and then the flesh color would be applied on top of that. You can also apply the oil paint very, very thickly. That's not very typical of the Renaissance. You'll see it happening more as we move in more modern styles, but thick application of oil paint is called impasto. Definitely, we've talked about the idea of the apprenticeship system. In this case, you're looking at the work of Gelandio, to whom Michelangelo served as an apprentice. So you can see in the beginnings of the High Renaissance, the generation that trains Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael begin to really make use of oil paint in thin glazes to create these incredible effects of highlight and shadow and this massive amount of detail. Remember, because oil paint doesn't dry super quickly, you can go back in and finesse it, make changes for several days. Uh, so a painting can be worked on in a way that is impossible with tempera paint and impossible in fresco. We've talked about the new introduction of mythological stories that is also tied to this new philosophy rising in the Renaissance that we call Neoplatonic thought. Neo meaning new, Plato referring to a philosopher from the ancient world. You've heard of Aristotle and Plato, of course. And so the new philosophers of the Renaissance, and they're depicted here in a painting by Gerlandio. This is a detail which shows you one of the leading uh, members of this uh, philosophical uh, society. This is Marcillo Ficino. You see him here. He's one of the leading philosophers of Neoplatonism or New Platonism. The idea that you could look for uh, examples in classical literature and philosophy that prefigured or were foreshadowing the beliefs that were to come in the Christian era. Mantegna is an important artist for us to know as we move toward the High Renaissance. He is best known for his use of very uh, believable three-dimensional illusions using foreshortening. One of the things that he's best known for is this piece, the Camera della Sposi, the Room of the Wedding ceiling painting. So this painting would have been seen from below. It has intense foreshortening. As a result, you see the feet of the putti, the little cupid figures, close to you. The length of their bodies is much shorter. So the foreground element larger than normal, the length of the height of the figure much shorter than normal. We also can refer to this as a trompe l'oeil painting literally meaning to fool the eye or to trick the eye. So you are tricked into believing you're seeing an oculus, an opening to the open air above you. This is a painting from Venice, and so we want to draw a distinction with the Venetian painters. They are sometimes a little darker in terms of the amount of light and shadow that they use, and the colors can be a little bit richer in Venice. The Venetian artists are known for their paintings. Um, one of the things that the, uh, is common in Venice is the production of fine glasswork, and so some of the Venetian paintings even have glass ground glass mixed into the paints to make them more luminous. This is one of the great leaders of the Venetian school, Bellini, his San Zaccaria altarpiece, which is, of course, a sacred conversation as well. My dogs are starting to bark in the background. I apologize. 
This is the work of Perugino, his delivery of the keys to St. Peter. Uh, it's very important also to know that Raphael will serve as an apprentice to Perugino. And we can see here a little bit of that Neoplatonic thought happening in a sense. You have a biblical scene happening in the same world and in the same scene, we see figures in contemporary clothing. So you can see that what they're doing is showing you that the beliefs of the ancient world, after all, Christ was crucified by the Romans, right? He lived in the Roman Empire. What we're seeing here is this movement between um, the beliefs of the past and the world of the present as if they are all one thing. This is a piece to know for sure by our high Renaissance uh, master, Leonardo. Leonardo is born first of the big three artists, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Leonardo pioneers a technique we call sfumato, or the smoky manner. You can really see that here. It almost appears as if the figures are um, coming toward us in uh, through a haze of smoke or fog. And that's very much what the smoky manner was. Leonardo liked to paint his uh, portrait in particular, having his models pose under a gauze awning that would help to filter the light. And he very much uh, pioneered that idea of painting at a particular time of day, either uh, before noon when the sun is at a sharp angle to the earth. Um, so a time when shadows would be really long, that kind of early, um, not sunrise and not high noon, but that long shadowed period of uh, dawn. The uh, equivalent would be just before dusk, um, what we sometimes call the golden hour in photography, when the sun is not quite setting, but it's not directly overhead as it is at noon. You have much longer shadows. Color just seems more intense. And so Leonardo is really using a lot of these um, optical effects. You notice that the figures almost seem to fade on their edges. They're, the shadows are so deep that it's almost hard to see where the outer edge silhouette of the figure ends. They seem to just kind of fade into the darkness around them, which actually makes them look much more three-dimensionally real. Just with a hard, dark outline or a sharp edge around them often make the images look more flat. And Leonardo is really well known for this incredible realism in three dimensions. He often also uh, will co uh, create compositions that instead of just being flat uh, triangular structures, begin to place the figures into what feel more like three dimensional pyramidical structures. So even the composition creates a sense of space. Again, we have the use of oil paint here in glazes. Uh, just remember that a glaze is a transparent, thin layer of oil paint as opposed to impasto, the heavy leaf. Uh, heavily textured area of paint. Of course, you know Leonardo's Last Supper, which also makes use of perfect one-point perspective. And of course, you know the Mona Lisa, which again uses clearly the smoky manor technique. You can see that applied all the way through the background, um, which of course is a masterpiece of uh, atmospheric perspective effect. This is a, not a formal piece of art to be put into a frame. Uh, this is from Leonardo's notebooks. And we know a lot about Leonardo's thinking as a designer, as um, a, an engineer, uh, even as some working on medical knowledge through what he provided uh, in his sketchbooks. Now, the sketchbooks have been collected. They're in various museums around the world. He did not date things consistently, and so there's no single um, textbook that has all of Leonardo's drawings in a sequential chronological order. It's kind of difficult to figure out uh, the dates on some of the works, but you know for a fact that, Michael, that Leonardo did uh, dissections of human corpses, and that was one of the really big breakthroughs in the Renaissance in learning more about human anatomy, and of course that is vital to the study of medicine. So here we have the embryo in the womb by Leonardo.
Moving to Michelangelo, younger than Leonardo and a massive career, whereas Leonardo was kind of known for being inspired by an idea and then abandoning it to be inspired by the next thing. Michelangelo is much more likely to finish and complete work. Uh, Michelangelo was also more successful in sculpture than Leonardo ever was. Michelangelo, in fact, thought of sculpture as the most important of the arts. Uh, he thought it was superior to painting, although he was a master painter as well. But Michelangelo was also very successful as an architect and as a poet. He was a really gifted writer. So Michelangelo is perhaps the best example I can give you of a truly fully rounded Renaissance artist in that he did everything and he did all of those things to an absolute perfect level of perfection. Michelangelo's David is a really remarkable piece in that it was created from a single block of marble that had already been uh, started upon by an earlier artist and abandoned. And this piece of marble had been kept by the Florence uh, Cathedral authorities uh, and believe, it was believed that it would never really be usable because of a flaw in the marble, and Michelangelo was able to actually create this incredible masterpiece from that block, and really pretty early in his career. This piece is dated 1504. It was originally intended to be placed on the cathedral. It would have been on one of the uh, architectural elements near where the dome touches the drum or the main part of the wall. So you would have seen the figure from below, and that accounts for some of the distortions. The hands, and especially the head, are much larger than would be uh, considered proportionate to the rest of the body because you would have seen it from below. So this piece has a very definite frontal view as well because he would have had his back toward the dome. You wouldn't really have been able to see him from behind. He is now uh, displayed indoors and you can walk fully three-dimensionally around him in 360 degrees and see him from all sides. Michelangelo's creation of Adam panel from the Sistine Chapel ceiling is perhaps the most iconic of the images from uh, that endeavor. That project um, was one that he was given, and that commission was given to him by the Pope, and the Pope insisted that he complete it. Even when Michelangelo tried to leave, the Pope sent his soldiers to collect him and bring him back to Rome to complete the piece. It's one of the most remarkable accomplishments in the Sistine Chapel. It is the single largest element uh, controlled only by one artist. In fact, the uh, artists of the generation right before Leonardo and Michelangelo contributed paintings for the side walls, but Michelangelo was allowed to create the composition, the plan for this entire ceiling entirely himself. It primarily shows the creation of the universe, uh, the creation of Adam and Eve and their expulsion from the garden. It then ends with some panels that show us um, aspects of the life of uh, Noah, the great flood we see. Um, and three panels toward the end show us um, highlights of the story of the life of Noah. But the most commonly referred to pieces show you the stories from Genesis. And you see here the creation of Adam, one of the most remarkable aspects being that Michelangelo somewhat changes the text. God, in this case, doesn't breathe life into the clay. That spark of divinity is kind of passed to him through the touch, which is kind of an interesting re-envisioning of that very difficult to tell story. It's also kind of remarkable to think about how the kind of nimbus around the figure of God the Father, where he's held up by all of these various angelic forms, seems to form almost the... Um, bisected hammer of a brain, or maybe even more accurately, it looks like the four-chambered human heart. So that idea of God creating man in his own image is really reinforced by this kind of anatomical perfection of Michelangelo's work. This is completed several decades after the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo is given another commission to create a piece in the Sistine Chapel. In this case, it is the altarpiece wall, which is the story of the Last Judgment. So Michelangelo works for a number of popes throughout his career. Um, 
he personally, I think, would have preferred to be known for his sculptural work, but he uh, did masterpieces of painting, and this is just one great example. Uh, he also did an enormous number of architectural commissions. So really, the cities of Florence and Rome are replete with examples of Michelangelo's sculptures, paintings, and architectural works as well. This would have been his crowning achievement in uh, a combination of architecture and sculpture. This was the tomb for Pope Julius II. And unfortunately, the Julius tomb uh, was a commission that kept being rewritten. The contract was rewritten multiple times, not only by Julius himself, but then by his heirs. And each time the number of figures, number of sculptures got smaller and smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer. Uh, and so Michelangelo referred to this sometimes as the tragedy of the tomb or the failure of the tomb. It's an incredible piece. Um, multiple figures and architectural elements designed and completed by Michelangelo himself. The crowning glory of the tomb Tomb is the Moses, and we see here that the Moses figure is horned, um, which is a mistranslation of the biblical account of Moses's face shining with light after his meeting with God when he's given the commandments. And we'll see this in other artists' work as well. Michelangelo kind of makes it look as though the horns are um, built up out of curls of Moses's hair, but there are other examples of horned Moseses throughout the Renaissance. Raphael is our last big uh, Italian uh, member of the High Renaissance or leading artist of the High Renaissance. And I often think of Raphael's work as combining the bright color of Michelangelo's paintings with the compositional style and the soft edges that are common to uh, Leonardo's style. It's almost as though Raphael is the culmination of everything that was the best of each of those two painters combined together in one. And Raphael is also, of course, much younger than the other two. Unfortunately, he um, does not survive a long time. His career uh, is cut short by a very untimely death. Um, there was originally a rumor about his death that he had literally um, overexerted himself in love mating lovemaking and had brought upon a fever, but in fact he died from malaria. Uh, Raphael himself appears in this painting. This is his School of Athens, and that's Raphael right there near the edge. He casts Leonardo himself here as the figure of Plato standing next to Aristotle, the two great uh, schools of philosophy are in conversation. And this figure we know was added. This, in fact, is Michelangelo as uh, the character here of Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher who preached the philosophy that nothing endures except for change. It's kind of a moody, emotional kind of philosophical idea that fits the character of Michelangelo very well. Turning our attention to High Renaissance in Venice, this is the work of Giorgione. It's one of the most unusual I can show you because it is not a sacred conversation. It's not a biblical story. It's a landscape with a nude. It's an odd narrative that doesn't uh, have a known source. We know that Giorgione changed the painting from its original form. Originally, the figure on the left was another female nude, and then he changed it to this figure that reads like a male soldier. Titian is Giorgione's apprentice uh, and occasional uh, co-author of works. Titian completed this piece, Venus of Urbino, in the High Renaissance in Venice. And it is a pretty remarkable piece for us in that it depicts, of course, a mythological character, but she very clearly is in what looks like a contemporary Venetian setting. And that's going to set up kind of a series of tensions that will go forward into Unit 2 and Unit 3 as artists begin to grapple with the idea of showing nudity in art to show the beauty of the human body is... Uh, desire a lot of artists have, but making it acceptable to your audience is always a concern. And so Titian gets around that by uh, depicting this figure, even though she seems to be a Venetian woman in a Venetian setting, by calling her Venus, it gives
this kind of air of respectability or acceptability to the nude. And we'll see other artists challenge that idea as we go forward. Another Titian piece to know is the Sacred Conversation painting here, the Pesaro Madonna, which is remarkable in its use of Venetian light and color, but also in that the enthroned Madonna and child are not in the slap dead center of the composition, they are off to the side of the center as if instead of looking at her head on, the image kind of spirals from the patrons up to the saints revering her to the throne itself. So it kind of operates in a more fully three-dimensional way. Following Michelangelo's style, these are still artists who are members of the high renaissance. They are still high Renaissance painters, but we can give them their own subcategory stylistically of what we sometimes refer to as mannerism or the maniera in Italian. This is sort of a backhanded compliment to refer to their work as mannered, that's what maniera means, implies that it's overly stylized. To to our ears, it's, it's kind of an odd term. We don't really use the term mannered very frequently in contemporary culture. Um, but to refer to someone as having a mannered way of speaking would mean that they have a very affectatious, very clipped and clear type of enunciation and pronunciation and presentation. I'm speaking to you now in an irritating and very pretentious manner, right? That's mannered way of speaking. So the mannered style of painting is overdone and pretentious to some later art historians taste. And that's why that term is applied after the fact. It's a little bit like um, what we would in the 21st century perhaps refer to as a backhanded compliment. It's a compliment, it gives them a name for their style, but it implies that it's not that great. You can see with mannerism, though, that there's a lot about it that appeals to contemporary taste. If you're a fan of surrealism, Salvador Dali and his melting clocks, you're going to love mannerism because it showcases exaggerated, elongated human forms. In most mannerist paintings, people don't have the correct proportions. Their proportions have been allowed to become elongated and altered purely to emphasize the beautiful, sensual curvature of the body, creating what we call the S-curve throughout the compositions. You can see the S-curve happening here from the figures at the top of the composition through the figure of Mary through the figures supporting the Christ figure at the bottom, and that is counteracted by a beautiful S-curve in the Christ figure back up to the figures at the top again. So there are these competing or compounded S-curves throughout. But if you really start looking at the figures themselves, you can really clearly see that this figure has a torso that's massively too long for the proportion legs or even the arms. And you see that throughout Mannerist style. This is the work of Pontormo. It's his deposition, uh, Christ removed from the cross prior to the uh, entombment. You can see exaggerated proportion in Correggio's portrayal of Jupiter or Zeus and Io. Io is one of the many human lovers that Zeus, Jupiter, uh, has throughout the uh, myth myths of ancient Greece and Rome. He appears to Io as a mist, and you can just barely see his face right there in the cloud, kind of giving her a smooch. This is perhaps the most famous interest painting in terms of elongated form. Even the title of it tells you that. This is known as the Madonna of the Long Neck. In Italian, it's Madonna della Colla Longa. And you can see here her neck seems to almost have more vertebrae in it than the typical human being should have. You can also see really exaggerated proportion in the leg of the supporting angel off to the side. The torso is tiny compared to the massively long leg there. And you can even see that in the Christ child. And even in the pose, the way she's holding him almost looks like he might slip out of her lap. But that is not meant to be disrespectful. It's meant to showcase or increase the number of and the elegance of the curve from her neck uh, 
to her arm, to the Christ child's body, and leg to the leg of the angel on the side. Parmesaninos, Madonna of the Long Neck. The argue, unarguably, inarguably, most famous of all mannerist paintings is this one, though. Bronzino's Venus, Cupid, Folly, and Time. It's a bit shocking. It is very sexualized. It definitely has distorted proportions and almost a contorted, impossible pose, especially when you look at the Cupid. There's no way that you could get neck into this position and have your back in this position and the high knee torqued out the way it is here to the side. It's just really physically impossible. Even the pose of the Venus figure is somewhat unrealistic in that she seems to almost be kneeling upright. She's seated, but her body doesn't really recede in space. It's almost as if she's propped up in space. Bronzino gives us a mythological subject with a very sexual theme. Most likely this was commissioned by the Medici to give as a gift to the King of France. The French court is much more uh, prone to overt sexuality in uh, work for the king uh, and to decorate the king's chambers. This image, though, is very much, um, I think, condemning some illicit aspects of sexuality. You can see the figure of Father Time seems to be pulling a curtain down to cover over all of this. We see that Venus, the figure of love, is kissing the figure of Cupid, who is, of course, the figure that can cause you to fall instantly head over heels in love. But he's also her son, which creates quite quite a frisson there. You see, though, that Cupid, of course, has two powers. Cupid has the power of causing you to fall instantly in love or to ha fall instantly into hate, depending on which arrow, golden or iron, that he hits you with. So he's capricious. Folly behind him is insensible. Folly is stupid. Folly is... Um, someone without intellect. And so Folly just sees people falling in love and is ready to throw rose petals everywhere. You see the figure of envy in the background. You can also see the figure of oblivion trying to forget. This figure here, though, is perhaps the most interesting. It is recontorted. It seems to have lion's legs or some kind of furred mammal legs that are also attached to a torso and tail that seem to suggest the pattern of scales of a snake, which is a Christian symbol, of course, for sin and Satan. You can see the arms of that figure, though, are impossible. They're not only stretched in an impossible way, but they're on the wrong sides. If you look at where the thumbs are, they really are on the wrong side of the body. And the face, again, on an impossibly long neck, almost reads like a mask, reinforcing our comedy tragedy masks here. So a lot of symbolism in this piece. Move from Italy to the north. And I gave you your chapters and lectures slightly out of order. I wanted to do all of Italy first and then go back and pick up early Renaissance outside of Italy into the high Renaissance in Italy outside of Italy. So anywhere other than Italy in Europe, we refer to in this unit as the North. So we're looking at Northern Renaissance. We're going back in time now. We just looked at examples from the 1500s, the High Renaissance. We're now going back to the Early Renaissance, 1400s. We are now in Burgundy. Uh, Burgundy is uh, where Burgundy wine comes from. Um, parts of what used to be Burgundy are now France and Germany. Uh, this is an example of an illuminated manuscript or illustrated manuscript. It is a book of hours, which is a kind of a textbook or a guidebook for your prayers, specifically for people who were not members of the church, for lay members. And this was obviously someone who was not a member of the church in terms of being a monk or a nun, but very highly placed. This uh, was the Book of Hours that was made for the brother of the Duke of Burgundy, so a member of the royal household. In the uh, Burgundian style of painting, you can see that much earlier than in Italy, there's a lot of use of oil paint, thin glazes, massive amounts of detail, but also the sense of space is very different. You can see in both this example here in the floor plane in the peasant hut, and in the next piece by Van Eyck, the floor plane inside this merchant's home, it does feel kind of as if it's on an odd angle. It's tilted upright a bit, as if we're looking 
down and in from a really high vantage point. But also the main detailed elements crammed really close to the front of the picture plan. And you definitely see that in the wedding portrait. Uh, Mr. Arnold Feeney and his bride are getting married at home in front of witnesses. You can see them in the mirror. And that was perfectly legal in Burgundy at the time. As long as you said the right promises to one another in front of witnesses, you were considered married. The entire painting is full of iconographic symbols, though, that you would have to be either born into this culture, have lived in it, or studied it to really recognize. Just one of the symbols, the green color of her dress, for instance, implies fertility, not the color we normally associate with wedding gowns in our culture today. Also, she seems pregnant, although in fact, if you look at how long the dress is in the back, you can see she's pulled a massive amount of fabric and kind of bunched it up in front of herself to suggest the fullness of the belly to suggest that she will become pregnant soon. The shoes have been removed to show respect for being in a holy situation or in the presence of God. And God's presence is also now noted here by the single candle. Obviously, this couple could afford a candle for every candle holder in their home. Why is there only one? The single candle lit represents God's presence in the home. You can see again that very tilted upward floor plane figures very close to the surface but massive ton of detail in Robert Campen's Marodi altarpiece which shows us an annunciation scene announcing Angel Gabriel telling Mary that she will bear the Christ child. You can even see Christ himself coming through kind of riding a sunbeam toward the womb. It's a pretty remarkable painting. This, again, is a bunch of figures very close to the picture plane. That is a hallmark of Northern Renaissance style. This is a masterpiece by Roger van der Weyden, another descent from the cross in which Christ's pose is mimicked almost exactly by the fainting figure of Mary, his mother, who is also closely associated with this memento mori, the skull that's a reminder of death. So he's taking on our sacrifice and what we will all have to face, of course, is death, is very much the symbolism of the mimic, mimicry of the pose in the, in the son and the mother's bodies there. Hieronymus Bosch, I think, is an artist that students who love the surrealism of Salvador Dali most often gravitate toward. Bosch also is giving us a very religious painting in this case. This is a triptych, an altarpiece opened so that we can see the interior of the side panels and the central altarpiece shown to us here. The center is the one to know that is known as the Garden of Earthly Delights, and it shows a lot of uh, raucous and naughty activity. Everyone's nude. People are in uh, groups. Uh, it's intense in some respects. Some of the activity that's happening is sort of shocking to think of as a religious painting. But remember what Bosch is showing us is that in our earthly world, you have access to all kinds of pleasures and sins. And if you succumb to them, then you will risk your soul being damned to hell. And that's what you're seeing on the panel on the right. So we have on the left the paradise that we lost through sin, the sin of our everyday world, and then the consequence, the hell panel on the right. Another aspect of Northern Renaissance that's pretty remarkable is that there are more paintings of daily life as opposed to scenes strictly from biblical or mythological sources. We call a scene of daily life a genre scene. Peter Bruegel, who is the um, Zion of a uh, family of painters, his sons will also uh, become painters as well. So you'll see descendants of Peter Bruegel. We call him Peter Bruegel the Elder, usually. and. Bruegel the Elder is also sometimes referred to as Peasant Bruegel because of his penchant for painting uh, daily life scenes of people of lower class as opposed to the upper class. Now, he made these for clients who could afford them, which is also kind of interesting to think that away from Italy, uh, interest in how other people lived was perhaps a little bit more 
prevalent in terms of the art making collecting of the elite of the Northern Renaissance. Turning our attention to France, this is one half of a diptych, also uh, could be considered an altarpiece. On the left, you see Etienne Chevalier, the uh, client, uh, and his patron saint, Saint Stephen. Stephen was martyred by being stoned to death. So you see he's carrying what looks to be a Bible, but a stone on top of that as well. And Etienne Chevalier was quite uh, a, a prominent uh, member of the royal court of France, but also a great patron of the arts. And there are multiple paintings uh, that he commissioned that depict him in them. This is the King of France, King Francis I, painted by one of his court painters, Jean Clouet. And it shows you not only the French style, um, which is very heavily uh, influenced by the Mannerist style, actually, of, of the high Italian Renaissance. Note the date here, we're looking at a piece around 1530. But notice the French fashion for very exaggerated, uh, large shoulder pieces on male clothing. So it creates a broadness in the chest that implies musculature and power. You can see that he has the hallmark uh, Renaissance detached sleeves. Those sleeves have been subjected to what we call slashing. The fabric has uh, openings in it or cuts in it that allow the undergarment, usually silk in the case of the king, to be pulled through. And you can see how the slashing has been kind of held together with ribbons in various places. And you can see that fine fabric poking through in places, but particularly you find that in the sleeves. This is very much meant to make the male body more masculine to the taste and style of that day. So that very, very broad shoulder is meant to kind of taper to a thin waist, making the body appear almost like an inverse triangle, with the apex of the triangle uh, being the waist. A painter who's actually from Greece, but lived, uh, trained in Italy for a time, but lived for his mature career and his um, most famous masterpieces were all executed in and around the court of the Spanish king. This is El Greco, a uh, nickname that means the Greek, and his most famous piece is the burial of Count Orgaz, who was a member of the Spanish aristocracy. Uh, the legend about his burial was that saints appeared and actually lowered his body into the grave, and so that's what's being depicted for you there uh, in almost what you could call a Spanish mannerist style. Very exaggerated elongation of figures is very, very common to El Greco's style. I would call him the most famous non-Italian mannerist painter. Another great uh, aspect or very easy to, to tell the difference between the Northern Renaissance style um, and the Italian Renaissance style is this aspect of being more uh, attuned to the gruesome aspects of storytelling and the depiction of pain in the body. You find that much more frequently in the Renaissance, particularly here in the German Renaissance painting by Matthias Grunewald. This is his crucifixion scene from the Isenheim altarpiece. And this altarpiece actually, of course, like many of them, has side panels or wings that can be opened and closed. This is actually the way that the Isenheim always would look on most days of the week, on average days, not high holy days, but just any old random day of the year when someone is going into the church to seek solace or to seek an opportunity to pray or commune with God. And we know that the Isenheim altarpiece was in a church that was attached to, was the chapel that serviced the men and women who worked in a hospital that treated people who were dying from the plague. So the people who are coming to this church are sick or are the caregivers of people who are sick with something that there is no cure for. So imagine the kind of pain and emotional despair that the people seeking solace in this church would be feeling and imagine how you might be uplifted you were really feeling quite hopeless 
how much hope you might be able to feel imagining that God had come down to earth and taken on human form as Christ and had suffered not just somewhat, but suffered more even than you are suffering as a victim of the plague itself. It's kind of really reassuring to think that God understands the absolute worst pain and despair that a human being could possibly know. And that's exactly what this painting is meant to evoke. It is gruesome, absolutely it is. And I'm not saying that that is something that the artist was celebrating. It's more that by showing us this intensity of suffering, we're meant to believe that God understands us. He knows how hard human life is, and he understands what it means to suffer. And that's really what you're seeing in Grunewald's crucifixion crucifixion. The arms are dislocated at the shoulder from the weight of the body pulling down against the nails. The ankles are broken as the weight of the body sags downward. The feet can't move because of the nail there, and so the ankles break. That's really how a person dies from crucifixion. It's not so much the nail wounds, but the exposure and the weight of the body pulling downward as it's left over time. It's an intense and terrifying kind of vision, and it's very, very human. Another genius German painter, Albrecht Dürer. Dürer is best known as a painter, but even more so as a printmaker. This is his gorgeous self-portrait. At the age of 28, he very lovingly showcased every single curl of his hair. For those of you who don't know me in the real world, I'm quite bald, so I'm always a bit jealous of Dürer's incredible hair in this painting. Uh, but you can see his attention to anatomy very clearly in the way he's handled the face and the hand. You can see that high fashion uh, knowledge that he has. You can see the slashing in detachable sleeves that he wears as well. This is perhaps Durer's... Hush, hush. This is perhaps Durer's most famous of his prints. And Durer is known to us not only as a painter, but as a printmaker. So a printmaker usually in the Renaissance at this point would be employed to make copies of masterpieces that could be then uh, and printed uh, for distribution of imagery. So people would recognize a piece if they were not able to travel to see it in person. So very few of the Renaissance artists are actually making original art using printmaking techniques, but Durer is one of those artists, and perhaps the single most important artist doing that, especially outside of Italy at this point in the High Renaissance. So Durer is giving us here an engraving, and an engraving is an image that's made by incising or scratching lines into a flat piece of copper. Ink is applied to that copper and wiped off, and that forces the ink down into the grooves that were uh, incised earlier. Then dampened paper is put on top of the metal sheet. It is run through a printing press, which applies pressure with a cylindrical drum, and that forces the paper down into the grooves, picks up the ink, and allows you to recreate or reproduce that same image multiple times exactly the same way. So prints are considered each one to be an original work of art, but there are multiple copies. And we know that Durer gave a set of this series of prints there are three images in the suite. One uh, edition, as we call it, one uh, printing of those three images was given as a gift to Martin Luther. This is Durer's Night, Death, and the Devil. And in this image, the human soul, the Christian soul, is shown to you as the knight who is bravely facing uh, the inevitability of death, who's holding the hourglass and of course is trying to resist the influence of the devil that you see as that kind of horned goat-like creature in the background behind him. The French Ambassadors is another important piece for us to know. Uh, it is a painting uh, by Hans Holbein and Holbein is working in the uh, in the uh, French court. He's working um, though the ambassadors who have come to serve Henry VIII, the English king, uh, so I misspoke earlier, and Holbein is working for the 
king of England, uh, but what he's depicting here are the members of the French ambassadorship who have come to um, parley with the king of England. They are ser somewhat serving both kings in the role of ambassadors. The most remarkable aspect, though, of this painting is that it includes a kind of hidden image. It has what we call an anamorphic projection, an image that is um, created by distorting uh, a perspective view. And so you can only see that image correctly if you approach the painting from a very particular angle. We see this nowadays, believe it or not, quite frequently with street artists doing chalk art on the ground. And so if you see their image from the correct angle, it creates a perspective illusion. This painting would have been hung in a staircase. If you saw it from the right angle from the side as you're walking down the stairs, you would actually see that strange shape at the bottom in the correct perspective, quite suddenly, it would appear as kind of a floating human skull. And of course, that is a memento mori, or a reminder of death. And you'll see that quite prominently, the use of this image of a skull as a reminder of how brief life is very frequently in our unit two going forward. And that should cover all of our vocab and all the artworks to know for this unit test. So good luck. Thank you.